Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please stand. We'll begin in prayer, and we'll invite Father Shear, who's the parochial vicar here at St. Timothy's, to come up for that. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great gift of life which you have shared with us, and for the gift that you have given us of giving us our Catholic faith. We ask that you allow us to come to know your truth more clearly tonight so that we may follow you with all of our lives so as to arrive through you at the joy of heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you very much, Father Shear. Our speaker this evening is the director of the Westminster Institute, which focuses on the Islamic world and religious freedom. A former director of the Voice of America, Robert Riley has taught at the National Defense University and has served in the White House in the office of the Secretary of Defense. He is currently a member of the board of the Middle East Media Research Institute, and he has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, Digest and National Review, among other publications. His most recent book, a revised and expanded version of his two... 2002 work, Surprised by Beauty, was published in April of this year, and we are pleased to announce that he will be returning to the Institute to speak on this topic next year, so we're excited about that, and we are delighted to have him back at the Institute of Catholic Culture, so please welcome back Mr. Riley. Monica, thank you very much. Thank you, Father Shearer, for hosting the event tonight. Just to ensure that I don't in any way relax, my pastor, Father Fisher, is here from St. Ambrose, <laughs> in case I slip into any unorthodoxies, I will hear about them. Now, I'm usually speaking on a subject that is sufficiently distressing that I refuse to do so without an adult beverage. And if it's not one of those subjects, then it's a cause for celebration. <laughs> Tonight, I think we're more on the distressing side of things, as the topic is, I believe, false dichotomy, religious belief, and public morality. I think that's the topic. Part of my bio in here was wrong, so maybe the topic, are we, is that what we're... <laughs> We're okay, Monica? Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm just kidding you. You know that. <laughs> so false dichotomy, religious belief, and public morality. Meaning someone proposes that there is a dichotomy between religious belief and public morality. Possibly you are personally familiar with this as Catholics. Whenever you attempt to opine on a subject like same-sex, so-called marriage, or abortion, or pornography. And they say, oh, you're a Catholic. Well, that's fine in your parish or your church hall, but don't tell us here. We're, we're not Catholics. In fact, we're not even Christians, so go back there. You don't belong in the public square. So this is the new mantra, this is the new public orthodoxy, that there is a complete dichotomy between religious belief and public morality. Of course, this is utter and complete nonsense in terms of the foundations of our own civilization. When I had a chance to remark to a... Um, a priest friend of mine that the students wandering around on the campuses today, in fact, we have to include more than the students, many people wandering around in the streets today, have absolutely no idea of the provenance of the ideas under whose control they are. 
They just mutter these orthodoxies. They don't know what the origin of the orthodoxies are in terms of the lineage of the ideas. Where do they come from? So Father Arne, who runs the Catholic Information Center in Washington in that wonderful bookstore, said, Bob, I have an example for you. A relatively recent Harvard graduate came in to see me. And there on the bookshelves was a book, in fact, written by a friend of mine, Benjamin Weicker from uh, Franciscan Steubenville, titled The Ten Books That Screwed Up the World. (laughs) And so this relatively recent graduate of Harvard opens the book and looks at the table of contents. And amongst those books are things like Hobbes, Marx, Nietzsche, Rousseau, Margaret Sanger, or someone like that. And uh, after looking at the, the table of contents, he looked up at Father Arnie and said, I've never heard of any of these. <laughs> I thought, that's pretty good, four years at Harvard, and you've never heard of Nietzsche or Rousseau or Engels. And, and so th- there we are. I, I met a uh, professor from Georgetown uh, recently who, I know this is going to surprise you, is actually a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's my alma mater. I know that they have betrayed their origins. Anyway, he told me, I used to have to spend the first part of the school year uh, deprogramming the students because their heads were full of Marcuse and all of this other nonsense. And I had to deprogram before I could then could teach them uh, something else. He said, I don't have to do that anymore. Now they don't know anything. (laughs) They don't know Marcuse. they they, They don't know anything except, of course, how they feel how they feel about something. So let's see how much we can get done here with this interesting topic, particularly since I'm going to need to read my notes and my glasses just broke. (laughs) Perhaps something providential there. See if they can hang together here for a moment. So dichotomy, religious belief uh, and public morality... What are we really talking about there? Aren't we talking about faith and reason? About the relationship between faith and reason? And isn't the dichotomy that we're being uh, proposed uh, precisely that there is some kind of broken relationship between faith and reason? Therefore, you people of faith, simply stick in your parish and don't bother us We are the advocates and proponents of reason. We're the ones in the public square. And you can't talk to us as a Catholic or Christian because there's no relationship between your faith and reason. Right? Isn't that what we mean by this dichotomy or this false dichotomy? In other words, what is being proposed here is a doctrine of the two truths. There's not one truth. There are two, and they're totally separated from each other. One is supposedly the truths of faith for those who accept them by this mysterious process of why anyone would accept anything so irrational as faith, right? That's the one truth. That's the false truth. And then there's the truth uh, supposedly proffered by reason that has absolutely nothing to do with faith. So I'm going to spend... uh, tonight talking about why this is a false dichotomy and why anybody who knows anything about Western civilization and how a constitutional order could have occurred on the basis of such a dichotomy. It couldn't have unless there was a relationship between faith and reason. And in fact, if these two were not in harmony with each other, What happens when they're not? We're going to start with a couple of 
contemporary examples, though this one from 1984 is probably be considered historical now. I feel it's contemporary because I, I participated in, in this. And this is I, probably something of which you've heard because it's very famous. It was the late Governor Mari Cuomo's address at Notre Dame back in September 1984. So here was this great Catholic political leader, intellectual, talking to the Catholic intellectual elite at Notre Dame about faith and reason or what the relationship might be and how one ought to behave in that public square. How ought one to behave? So he claimed he's Catholic. He's a governor. He's in the public sphere. Sphere. He's in church on Sunday. What's the relationship between the two of them? Very interesting. By the way, it was particularly interesting for me because I was working for President Reagan at the time, and I was set, sent to a television studio. I forget which network was carrying Governor Cuomo's remarks live. So I was in the studio to comment on what Governor Cuomo had said, and the other commentator was Jerry Brown. That's balance in the media, come on. (laughs) So I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights here of what uh, Governor Cuomo said. And you can use your groan meter to tell me what you think of it. Here's one of them. Quote, put aside what God expects. Assume, if you will, there is no God. Then the greatest thing still left to us is life. Unquote. If there is no God, then the greatest thing left to us is life. He said this within the 20th century, the greatest charnel house in history in which scores of millions of people were killed by regimes based upon the fact that there is no God? In Nazi concentration camps in the Soviet gulag? They didn't think life was then the most precious thing if there is no God. They eliminated it in a massive hemorrhage of blood. How could you say such a stupid thing? Life is sacred only if there is a God to sanctify it. You don't have to groan. You might know how I feel about his having said this. (laughs) Okay, a few other remarks. As a Catholic, I have accepted certain answers What was the question? I have accepted certain answers as the right ones for myself and my family. Now, there's a good ghetto Catholic, right? I've accepted answers for myself and my family. We certainly aren't going to speak to the larger truth of these answers, whether they're universal and apply to everyone because they're true, but they work for me and my family. Okay. As governor, however... Aha. I am involved in defining policies that determine other people's rights in these same areas of life and death. He's defining policies that determine other people's rights? I didn't know there was a governor that powerful that he got to define rights. I thought they came from the laws of nature and from nature's God. I thought our rights came from God, not from governors. But here he is, very busy. (laughs) Defining? No, sorry, not defining, determining other people's rights. Determining them. In other words, they must be an object of the governor's will such that he determines them but not according to what works for him and his family, but by some other criteria. I wonder what those are. Well, we know we are not required to insist that all our religious values be the law of the land. No, okay. 
nor would a denial of Medicaid funding for abortion achieve our objectives. Given Roe v. Wade, it would be nothing more than an attempt to do indirectly what the law says cannot be done directly. Worse, it would do in a way that would burden only the already disadvantaged. Removing funding from the Medicaid program would not prevent the rich and middle classes from having abortions. It would not even assure that the disadvantaged wouldn't have them. It would only impose financial burdens on poor women who want abortions. How terribly disadvantaged is it if you can't kill your child? Apart from that unevenness, there is a more basic question. Medicaid is designed to deal with health and medical needs. Of course, abortion is not a medical need. But the arguments for the cutoff of Medicaid abortion funds are not related to those needs. They are moral arguments. If we assume health and medical needs exist, our personal view of morality ought not to be considered a relevant basis for fill in the blank. Discrimination. Our personal view of morality ought not to be considered a relevant basis for discrimination. Well, then what ought to be the basis for discrimination? For instance, to discriminate right from wrong, the just from the unjust? Is there only a personal view of morality? I guess that's Sunday morality, the one that works for you and your family. But as governor, of course, we have no idea of how to reach a judgment about what that morality might be in a way that is universal. And here we go, and then I I will move on. He says, apart from the question of the efficacy of using legal weapons to make people stop having abortions, we know our Christian responsibility doesn't end with any one law or amendment, that it doesn't end with abortion. Can you see what's coming here? Because it involves life and death, abortion will always be a central concern for Catholics, but so will nuclear weapons and hunger and homelessness and joblessness. Do you know the one thing I've always noticed about hunger and homelessness and joblessness and even worry about being targeted by nuclear weapons is that you have to be alive (laughs) to be hungry or homeless. But if you're killed in the womb, there's no chance of your being homeless or in a home. And how he could use those weasel words and play the shell game to move around Catholic doctrine, it doesn't have to be Catholic doctrine, moral teaching to say that, uh, you know, this is one of these uh, issues. Now, then, then it got, okay, the, the speech was over, and the moderator turned to me first. And I was able to say, Governor Cuomo's remarks remind me of the words of St. Thomas More, who said to Cardinal Woolsey, quote, I believe when statesmen forsake their own private conscience for the sake of their public duties, they lead their country by a short route to chaos. I have to say that Governor Cuomo did have the decency of removing the portrait of Thomas Aquinas that he had kept in his office as governor. I'm never going to get to Western civilization if I spend all this time beating up on Governor Cuomo. But I have to just to show that there, there is a lineage to this thinking, like father, like son. Uh, in February 12, 2015, on a CNN interview, Judge Roy Moore, the Chief Justice of Alabama, 
asserted that, quote, our rights do not come from the Constitution, they come from God. Unquote. <clears throat> CNN anchor Chris Cuomo, yes, son of Governor, the late Governor Cuomo, objected. Open quotes, our laws do not come from God. You know that. They come from man. Our rights do not come from God. That's your faith, that's my faith, but that's not our country. Our laws come from the collective agreement and compromise. Of course, you know, this is so, so, so sadly confused. And to add to the confusion, I'm just going to, before we launch into our thumbnail sketch of Western civilization, speak of the Audacity of Hope, the title of the book by President Barack Obama. You try to understand from where could such uh, views issue. I mean, how could you think that about your country, about the origin of, of human rights, such as uh, Chris Cuomo stated? Well, you could do so on this basis, if this is what you thought, and here is what uh, Barack Obama wrote. Quote, implicit in the Constitution's structure and the very idea of ordered liberty was a rejection of absolute truth. The infallibility of any idea or ideology or theology or ism and any tyrannical consistency that might block future generations into a single unalterable course. Our country was based upon the rejection of absolute truth. As in these self-evident truths, as in the laws of nature and of nature's God. So there is President Obama reading moral relativism back into our Constitution so he could pursue the agenda that he has as the most pro-abortion president in our history and as so far. And as, of course, completely um, pro-same-sex so-called marriage. President Obama also made the interesting statement that this is not a Christian country. Do you recall that? This is not a Christian country. There's a certain element where I can see what he's in, in which what he said could be, in a narrow sense, correct. But certainly it's not correct in the sense that the majority of people in the United States today continue to be Christian. And that it was most certainly the case when this country was founded. Now, I have, I'm in the throes of writing a new book called in defense of the American founding from its Christian and natural law roots, in which I'm attempting to show that no such thing as the American founding and the constitutional government which our forefathers gave us was conceivable without those Christian and natural law roots. And of course, those natural law roots were Christian. They had been baptized by Thomas Aquinas and others by the time that they came to our founders. It's absolutely inconceivable that we could have had such a magnificent thing as the founding of this country. There was a great Jesuit at Georgetown in the 1950s. That's how far back you have to go. Not really. Father Shaw was there more recently, and he's one of the great ones. Joseph Costanzo made this remark back in the 50s, quote, nothing could be more disastrous to the results of long centuries of constitutional struggle than to uproot constitutional government and its representative, representative institution from those Christian political principles which inspired and directed their growth and wherever their first principles of defense. So the worst thing you could do to maintain, sustain, and defend constitutionalism 
is to uproot it, or excuse me, uproot it from its Christian roots. Now, have you heard of Father John Courtney Murray? He was another Jesuit back in the 1950s, and he wrote a very famous book called We Hold These Truths, in which he was showing how exactly copacetic the American founding was with Catholic thought. That, of course, is not to claim that the founding itself was Catholic because Catholics were a tiny minority in this country. The majority of the uh, signers were Anglicans. About two-thirds of them were Anglicans. In any event, back in the 1950s, he could already see, as could Father Costanza, the forces of acid eating away at the foundations of, these, of this country and of the founding principles. And he uses the term voluntarism. Uh, this is a technical philosophical term, meaning the supremacy of the will. Kind of reflected in Governor Cuomo's remarks, you see. It's not the primacy of reason of what we discover to be so, to be true, to be just, through our reason, it's what we will. Right? Will comes before reason. Reason serves the will, not the other way around. So the supremacy of the will. We are seeing more and more of that today, are we not? In which certain Supreme Court justices find in a constitution in which it is Absolutely impossible to find such a thing as a right to base a marriage on the act of sodomy. I mean, what's this? What, what is that based on? It's based upon pure will. Pure will and power, not upon the primacy of reason. So anyway, John Courtney Murray sees this seeping into American intellectual life back there in the 50s. And he says that if the founding principles of the American uh, founding were further imperiled, quote, then the guardianship of the original American consensus based on the Western heritage would have passed to the Catholic community within which the heritage was elaborated long before America was, unquote. Right? What he means here is that the natural law tradition within the Catholic Church going back to the Middle Ages was strong enough to resist the modern voluntarist corrosion afflicting America. A recovery would be possible because of what Murray called, quote, the evident coincidence of the principles which inspired the American Republic with the principles that are structural to the Western Christian political tradition, unquote. Of course, the, the, since the founding principles developed from the Western Christian political tradition, it was more than a coincidence that these traditions, these principles aligned with each other. One came from the other. Our principles are those from the core of the Western Christian political tradition. Now, I want, of course, to regale you with what the founders themselves said, but what did, what did they know about what they did and what principles they called upon. If we have time toward the end, I'd like to go over more of those because they're tremendously encouraging, they're tremendously heartening they really are, uh, continue to serve as a light if we would pay any attention to them. We might even send them to Justice Kennedy. <laughs> Though he'd know that they're just historical documents. That Okay, so let's, for instance, John Adams. He famously said, by the way, that... Uh, the government was not founded on the Christian religion. And you'll hear many people quote that who want to say this isn't a Christian nation, but they, they don't get what John Adams meant. And he explained it more fully in a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1813. Listen to what he said here. 
about the basic principles on which the founders achieved independence. Adams asked, quote, and what were these principles? I answer, the general principles of Christianity in which all those sects were united and the general principles of English and American liberty in which all these young men united. Now I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. And that those principles of liberty are as unalterable as human nature. I could therefore safely say consistently with all my then and present information that I believe they would never make discoveries in contradiction to these general principles, unquote. Hmm. Eternal, immutable. I wonder if President Obama ever read this. (laughs) What did he say here? Rejection of absolute truth. Well, where did the truths and principles of which John Adams was speaking come? And this is the thumbnail sketch of Western civilization I propose to give to you as constitutional government is based upon a certain anthropology of who man is, a certain theology of who God is, and a certain philosophy as to what things are and who man is. And strangely enough, in the history of mankind, only within one culture has such a thing as constitutional government indigenously arisen. Now, what culture would you think that was? Christian culture. And why was it? Well, there are several components, several several genealogies that came together in Christianity that I'll quickly try to go over, that without which... It would not have occurred to man to rule himself through deliberation and consent rather than be ruled by accident and force, which is how man was ruled through most of his history and how most people are still ruled today. So why ought he to be ruled through deliberation and consent? Well, before Judaism that thought would not have occurred to anyone because of the tribal lives that people led, because of the cosmological empires in which they lived, because of the gods under whom they operated. In none of those instances was there ever a revelation or a teaching that said that Man was made in the image and likeness of God. Do you know how revolutionary? I mean, this like that's like the air we breathe. Do you know how revolutionary that was? How extraordinary the Jews are in having received the revelation that I made you in my own image. You think without God, life is sacred? No, life is sacred because we are made in his image. And it's as man came to understand more fully what that image reflected in us was, it included things like what? Our reason, our free will, the inviolability of our person, that we had a relationship with God that was personal, 
Do you think in the ancient world, in these cosmological empires or with the tribal gods, any, anyone considered they had a personal relationship with God? Or the gods? If you lived in ancient Egypt, ruled by many gods, but most immediately ruled by the divine Pharaoh, right? He himself was a divinity. Uh, your participation in the divine order was determined by your proximity to the Pharaoh. So in sort of concentric circles, in, in terms of that proximity, you could see uh, or judge the importance of your life. You know, you're in the royal court, you're really important. Then you go out until you're on the hinterlands and you have no importance whatsoever. Because the very meaning of your life was gained from your proximity to the divine or the semi-divine ruler. You of yourself were absolutely nothing. And that's why you could be ruled basically as a slave. The meaning of your life came from this divine or semi-divine ruler. Do you think in this uh, conception of the world there was, there was any distinction between the religious and the civic order? None, none whatever. The dichotomy was inconceivable to ancient man. There was no distinction between religion and civic life as religious life was a civic duty. And your obligations were to the gods of the city uh, and to your tribal chiefs. And you had no way of knowing what was right from wrong other than the way of your fathers. And you followed the way of your fathers and the other tribes followed the way of their fathers. You had no way of knowing who had a better way and who had a worse way because there was no conception of nature or philosophy. So you're totally subsumed by the state. Then the Jews come along and say, first of all, there's only one God. He has made us in his own image. And he desires us. He loves us. He seeks us. This was a, well, you just, you read the Old Testament. How moving, how powerful. And Abraham gets up and argues. Moses gets up and argues. Jacob wrestles. This is a personal God. Can anybody imagine doing that with Quetzalcoatl, you know, the God of the Aztecs? Be lucky if you didn't have your living heart ripped out and you'd be thrown down the pyramid steps so the sun would rise the next day, right? By the way, that points to another key thing is that in these ancient empires, the world was seen to have been the product of a struggle between these demiurges, uh, God, you know, a, a demiurge of light and one of darkness and they were fighting it out And the world, as you saw it, was the product of this struggle. And when one side was winning, if if the dark demiurge was winning, well, then the volcanoes would go off and the storms would come and things like that. That's how they accounted for things in the natural world. Hardly a view of the world on which you would wish to base a constitutional government or uh, a life uh, guided by deliberation and and reason and choice, right? Because you're really under the control of these demiurges uh, who have your fate determined. You're, you're, You're the object of fate. You have no real freedom. So that freedom wasn't even uh, an idea. So the Jews came up with both the idea we're made in the image of God, and then what does Yahweh say? He makes this, and then on the seventh day, he looks back, and this is good. It's very good. So the world isn't on some impermanent uh, foundation that's going to come ripping apart because the god of darkness is winning the fight today. No, everything God made was good. And God is not the origin of evil, There's not some bifurcation in God with the good side, the light side fighting the dark side. Everything is good. Evil is located in man's will, 
And that's how it entered the world. Boom, there went pantheism. So this is, this is absolutely extraordinary. Now, concomitantly, but very differently, another revolutionary change takes place in Athens, in ancient Greece. Another account of the order of things is given by early Greek philosophy. Some say Anaximander, some say Heraclitus, Parmenides. First use the word in Greek, logos, which I'm sure you all know is the Greek word for word or reason. And what did they use the word logos for? They found that there is an intelligible order in the world. The seasons, the movement of the stars, the Everything seems to work according to a pattern that's more than a pattern. And it seems that our minds are able to apprehend these, excuse me, reality. Reality is intelligible to us. How could that be? How can we come to know it? So they speculated that behind this intelligible reality is An intelligence is a divine intellect. And therefore, the intelligible nature of the things we see is a reflection of the logos behind it. The primacy of intellect, the primacy of thought in Greek philosophy. That we can understand, first, this creation was first thought. And because it's a product of thought, through our thinking, we can come to apprehend and understand it. This, no more splitting open the breasts of doves and reading the entrails to see what the gods are going to do. No more splitting open a human heart and burning it so Quesdicall isn't so angry. No, no, you can come to know reality. You can come to know the truth of things as they are. And what's more, because you can know this and they're intelligible through your reason, you can know right from wrong and the just from the unjust. How can you know that? Because another revolutionary term with which the Greeks came up is nature. Things have natures which is what makes them what they are. In pre-philosophic ancient world, there was no way man had to make the distinction between, say, why a uh, fire hose was red and why a dog wagged its tail. In both instances, they'd say, well, that's the way of the dog or that's the way of a fire hydrant. Only with the distinction between, in philosophy of nature and convention, could people finally come to realize, no, fire hydrants are red because that's a convention. It's just a custom. We decided to paint fire hydrants red. We could have made them green. There's nothing. And dogs wag their tail because that's the nature of the dog to do it. So we can make this distinction between what exists by nature and what exists by custom or convention. That had never been done before. And when we come to understand what is nature, we see the ends for which things act, including ourselves. Just as we can know our eyes are to see and our ears are to hear that that's the nature of our ear, we can know the larger end The larger purpose of ourselves is, as Aristotle said, happiness. And in what does that happiness consist? Virtuous actions that lead to that happiness. And do we know what virtue is or is it anything we say it is? 
No, it's only action in conformity with the good according to our own ends, according to what we are. You can't achieve the good of an ear by putting a pencil through it. Because <laughs> then you'd be deaf. So the moral goods of which Aristotle spoke are not ambiguous. They're not even harder to know than the ends of physical things. In fact, you can know them with as much certainty as you do that your eye is for seeing. And indeed, you see this in incredible brilliance in uh, Aristotle's ethics. Now, again, staggering, a staggering revelation, staggering, well, I said revelation, a staggering leap for man in... um, his, his understanding of the world and in the foundation of what then eventually evolved into the American founding. Now, what about then the distinct and co- distinctive contribution of Rome, of Christianity? With Christianity, you, you have the universalization of Judaic monotheism because the Jews remained a tribe as they remain today. I think the greatest tribe that ever existed. And only with Christianity did monotheism become universalized. And there is this extraordinary aspect to it. It's certainly the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It's certainly the fulfillment of Jewish revelation and the promise of a redeemer, of a Messiah, of a restoration of creation and man's redemption. But do you realize it's also a fulfillment of the promise inherent in the insights of Greek philosophy? I always like to imagine, thinking of Heraclitus, in his home in ancient Greece, speculating on the Logos. And then Logos walks through the door. Logos is a person. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was God and the Logos was God and was with God and all things are made through God as Logos. Now we know why the Greeks found creation intelligible because there was this Logos behind it. Indeed, the Logos had created it ex nihilo from nothing and the Logos sustains it in its being and then beyond anyone's imagination in the ancient world, Logos saves it. Logos is also agape. Logos is also this sacrificial love that then takes this teaching of the Imago Dei, which is universalized in Christianity, spreads it, and it then begins to affect all behavior. I want to find this one statement, if I can, because I, I love this, this um, statement because of what it shows us in the interpenetration of Christian revelation, its marriage with philosophy, and the effect that it then has on the political order. Now, I could read to you any number of things from St. Paul, his letter to Philemon, about, you know, take the slave back, but not as a slave, but as my brother. And there's no longer, you know, Jew or Greek, free or slave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the most extraordinary things in the world. Now, Benedict XVI said this about the impact of this great revelation on the world. Quote, even if external structures remain unaltered, 
This changed society from within, unquote. Here's a manifestation of how it changed society. Fairly early on, this is only in the third century, no, sorry, fourth century, St. Gregory of Nyssa. Of course, the Roman Empire was a slave empire, right? Slavery was the common practice of mankind throughout history. So what kind of impact does Christianity have on this? So we're in the fourth century with St. Gregory of Nyssa, here's what he said. For what price, tell me, what did you find in existence worth as much as this human nature? Note the word nature. What price did you put on rationality? Notice the primacy of reason. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. If he is in the likeness of God and has been granted authority over everything on earth from God, who is the buyer? Tell me. Who is the seller? To God alone belongs this power, or rather, not even to God himself. For his gracious gifts are irrevocable. God himself would not reduce the human race to slavery, since he himself, when he had been, when we had been enslaved to sin, recalled us to freedom. Your origin is from the same ancestors. Your life is of the same kind. Sufferings of soul and body prevail alike over you who own him and over the one who is subject to your ownership. Pains and pleasures, merriment and distress, sorrows and delights, rages and terrors, sickness and death. Is there any difference in these things between the slave and his owner? Do they not draw in the same air they breathe? Do they not see the sun in the same way? If you are equal in all these ways, therefore, in what respect have you something extra? Tell me that you who are human think yourself the master of a human being and say, I bought male and female slaves like herds of goats were pigs. Unquote. What do you think of that? I wonder if Abraham Lincoln read this. This is one of the most powerful indictments of slavery I have ever read. And of course, as culture became more Christian, slavery became more unacceptable. And by the time of the Middle Ages, of course, there there really was no slave there was no slavery in Europe. Then I'm going to touch upon briefly the achievement of the Middle Ages in which all of these developments congealed in the first constitutional orders. The Middle Ages, of course, as soon as you mention the term, you're told, oh, you mean the Dark Ages. And then you have to remind people that the notion of popular sovereignty, the notion of representation the notion of account- political accountability, the justification of the killing of tyrants, the limitation of political power. All of these were developments of the Middle Ages as it began to articulate in law the respective realms of Caesar uh, and what was God's. What was the churches and what was the states? Though obviously Christianity taught this from the beginning, the Middle Ages was the first fully Christian order. And it is there that we find the articulation through canon law and through civil law, these respective realms in their respective sovereignties. This was unknown in prior mankind, 
that the same people would be under two sovereignties, the two sword theory, the church and the state. Therefore, one, there, not one sovereignty could monopolize man because the church recognized the legitimacy, excuse me, of the state and the state recognized the legitimacy of the church in their respective realms. Never before in history was, was there anything like this two-sword teaching, which began with Pope Gelasius, but reached its fruition, as I say, in the Middle Ages. To, to capture this, I found a wonderful quote from a French writer in the 19th century, Benjamin Girard. I want to read this to you. Quote, Christianity was the greatest benefactor of the Middle Ages. The dogma of a common origin and destiny for all men alike was an unceasing argument for the emancipation of people. It brought together men of all stations and opened the way for modern civilization. Men, though they did not cease to oppress one another, began to recognize the fact that they were all members of the same family and were led through religious equality up to civil and political equality. Being brothers in the sight of God, they became equal before the law. The Christian became the citizen. This transformation took place gradually and slowly as being necessary and inevitable by the continued and simultaneous enfranchisement of men and of land. The slave, whom paganism, as it disappeared, handed over to the Christian religion, passed first from a state of servitude to a state of bondage. From bondage, he rose to Mortmain, and from Mortmain to liberty, unquote. I think in that paragraph, you get some sense of how the culture was suffused with this teaching and the practical result it produced was constitutional government. After the Middle Ages, there was a tremendous reverse uh, that took place, first of all, through William of Ockham, who reversed Thomas Aquinas' theology and said, Actually, intellect doesn't have primacy over will. It's will that has primacy over intellect. So he came up with a a theology of the will. Luther grabbed on to this and said, because God is pure will and power, has no relationship to reason, faith has no relationship to reason. So talk about establishing a dichotomy. Luther said, famously said, reason is the devil's whore. Could you imagine Aristotle, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas saying anything like this? And this is how radical the break was from the preceding tradition that the primacy of reason was lost to the primacy of will because reason became illegitimate as an excuse uh, because uh, God had to be a certain kind of pure will and power. The next thing that happened as a result of this change was the um, secularization of this theology into a doctrine of the state by Hegel and the Leviathan. If God is pure will and he rules by pure will, well, that's the way man ought to rule too. So you get the foundation for, on the one hand, the divine right of kings. He's no longer accountable to his subjects. Um, There's no longer anything uh, like popular sovereignty. There's no longer a right to overthrow a tyrant. By the way, Luther recognized none of those things. Uh, And he rules only through his direct divine power uh, given him directly by God. No consent on the part of the ruled. Now, this secularization of will, the absolute state, was exactly what the founders of the United States rebelled against. That's the way they were being ruled by the British Parliament. 
Read the litany of abuses in the Declaration of Independence. What was unjust? What was against the laws of nature and of nature's God? The laws of nature and of nature's God. Do you think, do you think Hobbes recognized any laws of nature of nature? No, no, no. The voluntarist, they, they don't, things no longer have a nature. God is pure will and power. The prince becomes pure will and power. The prince becomes Machiavellian. Things no longer have an end other than the end you will them to have and you have the power to enforce. So the political order is transformed until there is a rebellion against it. And that rebellion against it required a restoration of the principles of medieval constitutionalism. So the continuity was broken, and then at the founding of the United States, it was restored, in which our, they, our founders, uh, lucky for us, recovered these ancient truths and what they referred to as ancient rights to which the American colonists were restored by their heroism and sacrifice. Do I have a minute to just try a couple of shots from the founders so you can hear them in their own voices? James Wilson, one of my favorites, who you know signed both the Declaration and the Constitution. Quote, the law of nature and the law of revelation are both divine. The law of nature and the law of revelation are both divine. There's no... There's only one truth. There's the philosophical logos and there's the logos of revelation. They're the same logos. And as he says, they are both divine. They flow, though in different channels, from the same adorable source. It is indeed preposterous to separate them from each other. The object of both is to discover the will of God. And both are necessary for the accomplishment of that end. John Adams, quote, Because we have no government armed with power, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion, avarice, ambition, revenge, and licentiousness would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. James Madison, architect of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government... Far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. False dichotomy? Yes, I think so. Again, Madison, the belief in a a God all-powerful, wise, and good is so essential to the moral order of the world and to the happiness of man that arguments which enforce it cannot be drawn from too many sources nor adapted with too much solicitude to the different characters and capacities to be impressed with it. America's government illustrates the excellence of a system which by a due distinction between what is due to Caesar and what is due to God, best promotes the discharge of both obligations. Unquote. You see, he returns to the two swords. We have the distinct ecclesiastical and the distinct civil, the two sovereignties over the one man. Patrick Henry, virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, my friend, and this alone that renders us invincible. If we lose these, we are conquered, fallen indeed, unquote. Let me close with 
this wonderful quote from Jedediah Morris. He was a congregational pastor. He was the, the, the father of Samuel Morris, the uh, inventor of the Morse code, the, of the telegraph. Quote, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoys. In proportion as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, either through unbelief or the corruption of its doctrine or the neglect of its institutions, in the same proportion will the people of that nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. All efforts to destroy the foundations of our holy religion ultimately tend to the subversion also of our political freedom and happiness. Whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present republican forms of government and all the blessings which fl- flow from them must fall with them. Unquote. False dichotomy? Yes, I think so. And the proposal of this dichotomy to ghettoize us, to remove us from the public square, is part of a plan to so secularize and centralize this country that those freedoms for which our founders fought and strove so that we might enjoy it uh, will be gone. Thank you very much. All right, so who's got a question? What do you think of this latest example of, of false dichotomy? The, the article today about the American Bar Association is changes model ethics rules pro, to prohibit attorneys from engaging in speech or being a member of any organization, even churches that holds traditional views on marriage. I think that's a brilliant example. Unfortunately, one of many. And for those of you who haven't suffered through my book, Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything, the longest chapter in there is on the court decisions. And uh, as depressing as the research was for this book, and I had to look at some very, very dark things, The single most depressing thing was reading the legal decisions to think that people at the level of Supreme Court justices couldn't think their way out of a wet paper bag and they would get an F in freshman philosophy. It's it's so impoverished. It's a disgrace to our founders. By the way, do you know about our founders? I've been looking into their education Of course, many of them went to colonial colleges, and guess what they studied there? The trivium and the quadrivium was the same as the uh, the medieval curriculum. And do you know what they had to do before they got in? What was the entrance exam? They had to speak Latin. And they had to know some Greek. And by the time they got out, uh, many of them knew Hebrew as well. Uh, so that's what we're missing today. Uh, it, it's, but that's a perfect example of this, the enforcement of this dichotomy, the two truth theory, and that uh, uh, the, the, they are going to attempt to move uh, us further and further to the sidelines uh, to make what we have to say impermissible and punishable. We all know that's happening now. That's why I have this red wine here. <laughs> there was an article that I noticed uh, earlier this week. I didn't get a full chance to read it. It was from Mosaic Magazine, which I believe is a Jewish magazine, um, which took the angle that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 laid the groundwork 
for the attack on religious liberty, um, and that there were some, even back then in 1964, who recognized that, um, but because of the need for um, the, uh, you know, a civil rights uh, act to attack the discrimination, racial discrimination, they remained silent. Can you speak on that? What do you think on that? I, I vaguely have heard that, but I confess I've never studied it. So I don't know. Certainly one's, uh, the injustices under which black Americans were living had to be addressed. Whether that was the right address or not, I have to say is not something I've, I've really taken a careful look at. Yeah, hi. Um, I was thinking about with, with the Cuomo comment in the beginning, and isn't, with, with, this, with this idea of discrimination and these differences in poor and, and, and rich and the, the differences in classes, is, hasn't, hasn't a, a, what, what I, I guess is best called Marxism, hasn't that been more convincing to Westerners, even in the church, than, um, than Christian values? Uh, or, or, or you know Christian values isn't isn't this really a type of Marxism that is and I think of the term social justice um, isn't that now becoming some of the the you, you mentioned one of the, the well that's okay. yeah that's a good point to make because the purest expression of uh, pure will the purest expression of voluntarism is a secular ideology was Marxism on the one hand and Nazism on the other, the triumph of the will and the denigration of reason. And we, we are seeing uh, this manifestation in our own country today uh, because, in, and, and of course it's not as naked as either Marxism or Nazism, but here is what it is about. It denies The, that the ultimate end of man is in a transcendent state before the judgment seat of God in the mercy of Christ. That perfection is only obtainable there, not here. And the attitude, which, which was explicit in both uh, Nazism and communism was that this very kind of thinking is what has blocked man from reaching the state of perfection that he otherwise would have if he didn't believe this nonsense about God or this state in the future in heaven and so forth, right? So all we need to do is get control over things and we can do it in the barn. You know, we can build the perfect society here. We can, uh, through the power of science and a centralized state, so organize things that will achieve the perfection of man. And that's what's operating here. The false forms of immortality uh, sought through cyrogenics and all of the nonsensical things that are being pursued in our society are all reflections of this. I found this recently uh, in some old files, and I wanted to give you a taste of what this sounds like in a more naked form, as this comes from uh, Adolf Hitler. Quote, these religions are all alike. No matter what they call themselves, they have no future, certainly none for the Germans. Fascism, if it likes, may come to terms with the church, so shall I, why not? That will not prevent me from tearing up Christianity root and branch and annihilating it in Germany. For our people, it is decisive whether they acknowledge the Jewish Christ creed with its effeminate pity ethics or a strong heroic belief in God, in nature, God, in our people, in our destiny, in our blood. 
a German church, a German Christianity is distortion. One is either a German or a Christian. You cannot be both. We don't want people who keep one eye on the life in the hereafter. We need free men who feel and know that God is in themselves. Well, of course, he's not talking about the Imago Dei. He's talking about a neo-paganism. So you can't be a Christian and a German at the same time. And though in less, in less explicit a form, we're being pushed to say, well, you can't be a Catholic and an American at the same time, right? Who, t- who, j- who just told me about Cuomo's remark that if, what? Andrew, Andrew Cuomo said, leave New York if you don't, em- if you don't embrace same-sex so-called marriage, Right? A little manifestation of that, and as they gain more power, uh, that's that's the direction in in which things will move. And I must say, the reason why I wrote this book, or why I'm writing this book, why I'm a year behind in writing this book, is that even some Catholic conservative intellectuals have embraced the idea that the reason why we have reached this terrible situation today of this radical autonomy of everyone getting to create their own meaning of the universe is because of the founding. Not in spite of it, but because of it. That this radical understanding of man is contained in our founding. I thought, oh, that's great. If that's what Catholic conservatives are thinking, our goose is real. You, you know, you, that's just the opposite of what is the case. The founding isn't the problem, it's the solution. We're the problem, we've left the founding, as you could tell from those remarks I just read. But you're, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's what's happening. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.